Thank you guys for logging on today. This is our last webinar for the month of uh, September. And of course, what a better way to end it off than with Mr. Seth Whitehouse talking about volunteer spiders. Seth has a lot of pretty good experience. He has his entomology master's from the University of Georgia. He's had time as a director and now he um, has moved to Anderson County as one of their agents. And uh, he's gonna give us a little bit more information about spiders here in Tennessee. So thank you so much, Seth, for coming on and take it away. All right, thank you very much, y'all. Glad y'all had your lunch today and hopefully stomach some cool pictures of uh, some creepy crawlies while, while you're eating lunch. I really like this title. It might be a little cheesy, but we are in the volunteer state. You know, we like to talk about our volunteer background here and especially with our spiders. We wanna get that point across it shouldn't have to be a scary organism for us. Uh, it can actually be a huge benefit for our garden. Having this picture up here, because you know we all see our garden spiders, they're providing us services um, in our garden and actually consuming a lot of our pets. Before we kind of dive in, you know, I kind of wanted to show something real quick. I'm going to share another screen if that's all right. All right. So this is just a little uh, good example here. I collected these spiders not too long ago and Reserve them in an isopropyl alcohol, so excuse the, the wetness around them. But yeah, so we actually have uh, two very different spiders, different tactics. And after this, uh, hopefully you guys will be able to identify these two. And something just to put it into perspective is very different sizes, hunting ta tactics, but they're ultimately going to provide the same benefit for us. Um, so we might come back to that here at the end and hopefully identify those. So go back to this PowerPoint right here. So why are we talking about spiders today? Halloween is in one month. Really excited. One of my favorite holidays. But also, you know, the medical importance that it provides as well. It's important to identify our spiders that might be harmful out in the environment. You know, and we'll go over those few that, that we might have in the southeast, uh, specifically in East Tennessee. Also, we've done a lot of research on the use of the venom for, for good as well that a few researchers are looking into. It's interesting to watch them, the way they make their web. Certainly are little engineers themselves, and that spider silk is consistently shown to be one of the strongest materials. And as we all know that, if we're hiking through the woods and running into these guys. So, you know, there's a lot to be learned about that spider silk. Household pest control. Yes, we hate having spiders in our, in our house, vacuuming those egg sacs to prevent further infestations, you know, sealing up any cracks or crevices in our homes to prevent them from coming in. But ultimately, they are looking for a food source. They are not looking to, you know, bite us or, you know, most of them are known to be very timid and hiding from human activity. But, you know, they're almost as our, uh, our roommates, if, if you want to look at it that way. And also, gardening pest control. Uh, that's one of the most important ones we'll be hammering in on this, on this talk. You know, just what they do for pest control and um, hopefully preventing them from pests from eating our crops that we, we'd like to eat. And also they're a, a very important part of our ecosystem. They're a food source for many birds, smaller mammals, lizards, wasps, and um, you know, ultimately they're actually pretty cool too. So that's why I kind of like looking into spiders as well. So here on the left is a peacock spider. It's a, it's a type of jumping spider and it actually uh, does a unique mating habit. And actually look it up on YouTube, it'll dance back and forth with its peacock. So uh, very interesting there. A lot of the ways they've evolved and all the patterns they have. The one on the right is the smiley face or happy face spider. Yes, that's the actual name for it. You can look it up. You can find these in Hawaii, actually. So if you guys need another reason to go to Hawaii, there you go. So other than that, I like to really talk about starting from the top and working our way down and getting a little bit more specific. But it all starts here at the animal kingdom. Broken that down, uh, we have vertebrae and invertebrae. Us as mammals, humans are here as vertebrae, but uh, what we'll be focusing on today is, you know, not necessarily insects, but a very closely related class here, arachnid. And just a little side note, I always think this is kind of interesting how we come up with this term arachnid, for those of you that might not already know this. Well, arachnids belong to arthropods. The class arachnida uh, actually came from a Greek mythology name. So it was said that the princess arachne actually challenged the goddess Athene to a weaving contest. And so when Arachne actually lost that weaving contest, she was turned and destined to be a spider and destined to weave for the rest of her life. That's how, you know, the term Arachne came up. If you ever want a very interesting, fun conversation point next time you're hanging out with some folks. So currently, from my sources, there are over 65,000 described species of spiders. We're going to talk about every single one of them today. I'm just kidding. No, we're not. 
we're gonna come we're gonna try to focus on our most uh, common ones that we'll have and talk about a few of our resources that we might use to identify them one tool that I was a little skeptical at the beginning that has really turned out to be a uh, wonderful iNaturalist is a app on our phone where you can actually take a picture of an insect a spider a leaf pattern and actually upload that and get recommendations on what it could be in uh, it's a, it's a great community to be posting with and, uh, you know, working with other fellow naturalists like y'all selves, discuss what we had found in that area. And who knows, we might have found a cool new, new species or maybe a, a very rare species as well. So I definitely challenge y'all if you haven't looked into iNaturalist. Great resource. A few other resources I like to talk about if you really want to get into it. Of course, the field guides. They're not a lot of specific in spider field guides, but the field guide to insects and spiders in North America by a uh, Arthur Evans is a fantastic find. You can get that at McKay's Bookstore or, or Amazon. And also Common Spiders in North America by Richard Bradley. And of course, your local extension agent. If you're not able to identify an organism, you can always contact us and we'll, we'll have that identified for you too. So what defines arachnida? The first thing, folks might get confused uh, between identifying you know, the class Insecta or the class Arachnida. It's just the fact that spiders and arachnids do not have antenna or wings. All insects have an antenna or wings. There are some exceptions. Don't quote me on that. Another one is arachnids have eight legs. Insects have six legs. Arachnids have two body parts. Insects have three body parts. If we're breaking this down at this demonstration here, some people actually might get these pedipalps actually confused for another appendage or leg. Please not get these confused. Some of these can be dr dramatically larger than you know other species as well. So pedipalps are for sensing and handling food and not necessarily for moving. Eight legs, these pedipalps don't get confused. We break this down into all the orders that we have within arachnida, find some pretty cool specifics here. So even if you look into the fossil records, there's a lot of cool spiders that we don't get to see today and maybe that's for a good thing. The fossil scorpion from the Silurian period, cool records of that that have actually evolved on from the whip spider all the way to the daddy long legs. So daddy long legs are arachnids, but they are not specifically what we are focusing on today, which is spiders. Other relatives to our specific spiders are scorpions, akari, which are ticks and mites. If y'all ever get the chance, uh, definitely check out some of these whip scorpions. They're really cool creatures. And so I did mention that uh, spiders don't have wings. Sometimes I'll get a few calls saying they saw a spider flying the other day and they might be confused. What, how could it have done that if they can't fly? Well, actually spiders, have a uh, very cool mechanism called ballooning. Uh, yes, balloon, like a birthday balloon. And that is where uh, very mostly younger spiders will do this for, for re relocation purposes. But they'll actually uh, use their spinneret uh, to produce uh, silk and it will actually carry them through air currents actually. A very cool tactic to you know quickly move across um, without wings. Our three medically important orders here are the scorpions, arane, and akari. So we'll focus mostly on identifying the arane order here. The majority of our spiders that we have might produce a very small bite here and there, but the majority are harmless to humans and, you know, rarely bite even when they're found in our homes. But there are two I would like to cover today. And those two are, are shown here on the bottom and we'll, we'll go into identifying their characteristics. And as I'm going through here, I like to really compare it to sizes of U.S. currency. So you'll notice that. So um, I might be talking about dimes, nickels, and quarters here in this presentation, so don't get confused. So the first one here is the Black Widow. So this is about a half an inch long, very, very glossy black spider with a lot of red features. The abdomen on the underside will contain that red hourglass shape that you can see here, and oftentimes that broken hourglass is the term that we'll use as well. But you can see very spherical abdomen here, not to be mistaken with the cephalopod. Other notes is very timid and unlikely to bite, often found in you know, concealed areas. So, you know, we might be digging through some clutter and accidentally stumble upon this spider. Use caution, uh, a poisonous or venomous, excuse me, um, spider that could cause harm. One thing that really bothers me is, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Spider-Man before. I think this one came out in 04, I think. It looks a lot like a Black Widow. And yeah, trust me, Black Widows are not going to turn us into Spider-Man. I like, I like that. I found that picture there that looks a lot like it. So, all right, let's move on to our next one. Another venomous one that we want to keep people aware of uh, that could potentially cause harm to, to humans. Uh, and this one's about the size of a U.S. quarter with their legs outstretched as shown here. Can be mistaken with a lot of our wolf or grass spiders. But as you, as you see here, I'll be mentioning some ID features that will really help to get down and getting a 
consensus on what the spider is. We're not killing a good spider, right? A good ID feature is actually, if you look on its uh, cephalothorax right here, uh, you'll see uh, some sort of instrument here. That's what we'll call the violin shape right here. Also, another feature, if we're not sure about that violin, is, you know, the spider only has six eyes, where, you know, a lot of other spiders um, have, have more than that, usually eight or up to ten, so, um, and including their ocelli as well. So, and again, they're not seeking out to hurt humans. Uh, they're often timid and, and found in stacks of wood and are often shown to be a little danger, more dangerous than the black widow, although it may not appear that way if you look at those two. So we'll show this violin on another schematic here, um, and you can really see that drawn out well. So now that we've gotten, you know, the bad spiders out of the way, there's only two that we have to worry about, right? Let's focus on the beneficial spiders, okay? And so to break this down into two parts, we'll have the web building spiders and the hunting spiders. And I like to really change these two tactics here because we were talking about how they're such a beneficial species and it really comes down to their hunting tactics as well. So web building spiders are, you know, our typical, you know, spiders that we'll think of, you know, Charlotte's web, or they conduct a passive feeding habit. So that, what I mean by passive is, you know, they're waiting for the pizza to be delivered to their door, right? So they're waiting on that food delivery um, and they're going to use that vibration on the web to actually go down and feed on their, on their prey. So in our gardens, you know, that might be a, you know, spottering just off a fly flying around or another type of harmful pest that is flying around in our garden that can be captured in that way. Oftentimes these types of spiders uh, have poorer eyesight than our, than our hunting spiders. So hunting spiders, they can actually, uh, depending on the species, and uh, they can actually perform active and passive feeding habits. Active in the fact that they are actually searching for and pouncing per se, on their prey as an actual hunter. Or they can just be sneaky, actually conduct a passive hunting tactic, waiting and going to capture the prey as it approaches. So if we have a hunting, passive hunting spider in our gardens, um, they can be waiting around your crops, waiting for those pests to come. And these hunting spiders usually don't survive well indoors. So that's why a lot of our cobwebs or web building spiders are actually found more indoors than a lot of our, our hunting spiders. I said that they were excellent beneficial species. And, you know, I talked about how on the left here, we have their sit and wait tactics of using that web uh, as a passive feeding habit, and also the hunting, right? So they have excellent eyesight. They can track down their prey. I would like to mention here as well, before someone asks, yes, spiders can perform intraguild predation, meaning that they can eat other beneficial species like spiders and other, maybe even the lady beetle. By and large, I would say they eat a lot of our pests that come in the garden as well. So get too caught up on that as well. Both of these overlap in that they are generalists as a beneficial species. Generalist in the fact that they have a very large menu, right? So they can eat just about anything. Like I said, you know, they can eat a lady beetle or they can eat an aphid. Hopefully they're going to be eating our pests that might be otherwise harming our crops. Not every beneficial species is a generalist. They could be a specialist, meaning that they're maybe a little smaller and can only eat aphids or, you know, maybe white flies as as spiders, as a large, they're excellent generalist species. We'll jump into uh, the first beneficial species here. Uh, and that first one is a grass spider. Again, we're going broad here. We're not gonna talk about all 65,000. So we could even break this down further if we'd like. A general grass spider. These are about the size of a US quarter. And one great ID feature here uh, is it will have a very prominent longitudinal stripes right here on its cephalothorax. So remember we had that two body parts with the abdomen and the cephalothorax, right? So we have those two stripes. Another one is we have these large, large spinnerets. This is what they're gonna be using to capture their prey and, and spin them, actually consume them. This hind spinneret uh, is a great prominent feature that we can see when, and when we might be getting it confused with a potential wolf spider. So if we see this wolf spider here, okay, yeah, it might, we might say it has that longitudinal stripe, but we can also look at that spinneret and see that it is not very prolonged. So we'll move on to wolf spider. A lot of these guys range from, you know, very, very small, smaller than a dime to as large as a U.S. silver dollar. And most of them are, you know, very darker brown, light brown, and usually with that contrasting uh, spots you can see on their legs or stripes. And these guys, unlike our grass spiders, are not web builders. They, you're not going to be able to catch them. They're going to be really quick, ground on the ground, running right by you. So good luck catching them. That's, that's my ID feature I have for wolf spiders. Um, and they don't have that prominent spinneret. Some people uh, oftentimes, as an extension agent, I get a lot of calls and 
questions and pictures of this spider, a brown recluse. Remember, we do not have that violin that occurs on its cephalothorax here. Remember, always look for that violin. All right, our next one is a fishing spider. This is one of the largest, among the largest, and it is not the largest in the state. And it gets, you know, just about a little larger than a US silver dollar. And it's brown with very darker brown patterns. It can blend in pretty motionless. So maybe it's conducting that passive hunting style there and, and waiting for that prey to come. And also it's found a lot near. All right, next one is a house spider. You can call this the American house spider, the common house spider. There's a lot of different common names that a lot of people get held up on. Uh, but as a general, the house spider. I uh, love this name because a lot of times this is the most common one I find in my house at least. And so this is about the size of a U.S. nickel. You're going to have a very brown and tan cephalothorax here. Very interesting patterns and these patterns can range. And you see how we did say that the black widow had a very spherical abdomen? Well, we're looking for that hourglass, right? And those red features. So let's make sure we're not getting this mistaken with any uh, um, harmful spiders. So looking for that hourglass. Also very messy cobwebs. You guys might not be very good engineers when they're making theirs. You know, a lot of times we might run into these or find these in, in a cluttered area, uh, maybe in our basement. Almost always found within their cobweb. Uh, they're very rarely away from their cobweb. You do run into one, be careful, there might be a spider in there as well. All right, the next one is a cellar spider. Pretty easy to ID, I would say. It has very, very thin body with very, very thin and long legs. Oftentimes very light tan or gray, about the size of a US dollar with those legs outstretched. A lot of people will also think these might be daddy long legs, but remember daddy long legs are in a different order called a pilionis. We're talking about arena here as a general order of spiders. These are also usually found you know, in or near their, their very messy cobwebs. All right, the next one is a yellow sack spider. This one, pretty fun to ID because it's tan with a very yellow abdomen, that yellow sac. It's a very flat appearing spider uh, if you're looking at it from the side angle. These ones don't actually build a web and are, are known to have a very painful bite. And you might think, uh-oh, this could be a, you know, brown recluse or, you know, another very venomous spider, but has not been shown to be very medically significant. Might be very painful like the yellow jacket, kind of different uh, painful bite there. All right, next is orb weavers. Of course, I have three types of very common orb weavers here. On the very far right, we showed this one at the beginning of the presentation. That is a garden spider. A lot of people, different common names too, black and yellow garden spider. Another one here on the bottom is a marble spider, very marble appearance here. And then we have the arrowhead spider. Uh, these are one of my favorite uh, orb weavers. Um, very arrowhead abdomen appearance here. Orb weavers as a whole range in size, and their excellent ID features are their organized, very grid-like webs. People call these cobwebs if they run into them. Cobwebs are very messy, silk produ production there. Orb weavers take, take time. They're, they're classy here, and they like to have that nice grid-like web. These are very, very common in our gardens, and one of the most common you know, to help our pests in, in the landscape as well. So very broad term here. All right. And the next one is a jumping spider. These do range in size. They're very small, maybe the size of a pencil tip there, about the size of a US dime, not larger there. These are one of my favorite styles and the fact that they have a very large headlight eyes here, uh, there on the bottom. You can imagine just two headlights looking right at you. And very flat faced, if you see it from the top dorsal side here, very flat faced cutoff there. Great ID features there. Uh, these do not build webs. I challenge you guys, another fun YouTube video to watch is the jumping spider's hunting tactics and how they'll actually track down their, their prey. It's very fun to watch. It's like a tiger attacking its prey there. Another note for the jumping spiders, they're excellent jumpers, first of all, hence their name, but they're also one of the cutest spiders as well. You gotta throw that out there, they're very cute spiders. Another one, which is, I don't think is very cute at all, is the woodlouse hunter. So this is about the size of a US nickel. Very, very dark and reddish brown appearance here. I put head here, but remember it's that body part that cephalothorax and a very gray abdomen. Oftentimes very orange reddish legs, you know, not another color that we've really talked about during this presentation. Their fangs or, you know, mandibles are very enlarged here. So that could be very intimidating if we run into these. But remember, a lot of them are not going to be terribly harmful to humans and won't put you in a coma real quick. So don't worry. So these are found, you know, usually under logs, looking for their louse or pill bugs and looking for their resource there. So definitely a beneficial species in our, in our landscapes. Another one is the lynx spider. This is one of my favorites. It's about the size of a U.S. quarter. There are other brown ones as well. The most common ones I've seen in my area 
are the, uh, the green ones, and they'll have a very striped face if you're able to get that close to them looking at them in the face, and very spiky, bristly appearance. So you can see on their legs, unlike many of the spiders we've shown today, I have those bristle appearances here. I don't want to recommend handling spiders at all, and especially not this one. Would not recommend that at all. It can also um, actively and passively uh, hunt for its prey. In our gardens, you see these, they are doing an excellent job at protecting our, our crops. And next one is the crab spider. When entomologists and those that study arthropods come up with names, I really appreciate the term crab spider here. It's almost that crab-like appearance where the, these two front pairs of legs are very, very long, almost appear like a crab here. Crab spiders are not web builders. They're about the size of a U.S. nickel. I've seen much, much smaller and immature ones as well. Oftentimes they're very neon green or neon whitish, very bright white, almost transparent appearance there is the best I can describe that. These are very commonly found on flowers. Yes, they're eating pests in our garden, but sadly, like I said, they don't differentiate between human interest on what's a pest and what's a beneficial uh, insect. You know, very well eat some of our pollinators that might be trying to land on those, but on those uh, flowers. Don't be too angry at crab spiders. They're just doing what they do. So how do we promote these spiders in our garden? A lot of times I like to show this integrated pest management pyramid here. Whenever we're thinking about pest populations in our garden, we like to instill this theory of IPM, integrated pest management. And this is where we're effectively starting at the bottom and using all the tools in our toolbox that we can. The first one that we might be thinking about is we want to keep our pest population down as much as we can. That goes into, you know, our plant selection, site selection, different resistant varieties that we might have and be able to incorporate in our gardens. The, the other one that would really help a lot with our spiders and to incorporate them in our gardens, giving them shelter in areas to provide overwintering sites for their egg masses. So whether that means by mulching around the garden, maybe not just plastic mulch, maybe actually an organic mulch here, or even cover crops throughout the winter to give it some sort of resource or area to, to overwinter there. And this might even cut down on the amount of spiders that are trying to find overwintering sites in our homes. So a lot of folks, you know, ask, you know, how do I prevent a lot of our spiders from getting in the homes? This could be another excellent tactic as well. Biological, that's exactly what we're talking about here, how those spiders are consuming pests and that prey, that's what they are. They're a predator. We're utilizing these spiders as best we can. And, you know, at a very last resort, when we want to, ultimately our, our end goal is to get the best crop that we can each year. The very last resort that we want to jump to if pest populations get out of control and our spiders and other beneficial insects might not be able to keep their populations down, you know, to looking to chemical controls. So whether that's horticulture oil or soaps, insect growth regulators or repellents, that might be a good place to start before we start jumping into other insecticides that might be able to harm our spiders in, in the landscape. Be mindful. We're in our gardens and we, we need to get rid of our pests and we want to promote our beneficials and especially our spiders. A few of those things that we can do in the IPM here. Another one I like to show is I promote these in the landscape as a whole. Maybe I don't have a garden, potted plants, but I keep finding spiders in the house. Well, one thing is to, you know, maybe not get your sandal out or, you know, your shoe out, kill that spider immediately. Help its way outside where it can actually get more pests to eat than inside. The best way to prevent them from our household in our areas, cutting down our amount of pests that we might have inside. So that'll ultimately create those spiders to go where the pests are. First thing here, if we can follow this yes, no chart here, is the spider deadly? So is it a black widow or a brown recluse? Yes. Safely eliminate it from your house area. Let's do that. No? All right, great. Let's get to the step number two here. The spider larger than my hand. Run away. I don't know what spider that could be that's larger than your hand unless you're out in southwest United States. That might be a strange thing. Run away. No, we'll, we'll, we'll try to handle that. Don't run away. It's okay. Never be afraid of spiders. Um, and then no, let's thank that spider um, because ultimately it is providing a lot of res beneficial resources and services to our garden and our landscape and our homes, cutting down our pest populations. They are a vital part of our ecosystem and hopefully we learned a little bit about that. And so we can thank that spider. Spider will ultimately say you're welcome. That's what we're, what we're going for, that cohabitation here. So. I hope y'all's spidey senses are tingling now. You guys had an excellent lunch and learn here. And now we kind of understand a little bit how these spiders can be incorporated in our gardens and in our landscape. Uh, I'd like to leave you here with our last little comic to open up some questions. What our spiders might be asking to eat in your garden. Thank you, Seth. That was very good. Yeah, that was super good. I really enjoyed that one. Wow. Uh, we have a question already in the chat. Uh, wolf spiders, are, is their bite a concern or no? Just about all spiders, let me back up here, all, just about all spiders have venom. 
that is how they actually capture their prey and are able to consume them. That venom, the ones that are producing venom that can actually harm humans and actually be a very potentially a hospital trip here, are that black widow and that brown recluse. Wolf spiders, if you do get bit by one, you will not have to go to the hospital, but it will be a very painful bite. So definitely try to keep your distance and respect those spiders. Thank you, Seth. And we have another question. How do spiders survive the winter? Yeah, excellent. So ultimately, different spiders can actually, um, you know, not need to eat, you know, feed on another resource uh, for months at a time. Uh, so a lot of times we'll try to find safe harborage uh, in our homes. Um, and so that's why they're trying to, you know, maybe get in there for an overwintering site. Um, and I know we talked about, you know, using mulch in our garden or other, you know, helping overwintering sites. How are they able to survive through the winter? Ultimately, you know, they don't need to eat a pest until that spring comes up maybe. And that's when they can maybe help and perform those beneficial services to our garden. So they'll be protecting their egg sacs over the winter. That's ultimately what they're trying to do is overwinter and, you know, make sure they're not out in the, the open where that cold snap could maybe um, kill them. The feeding issue, it can last for quite a while without question. Thank you, uh, Seth, for that. And we have another one here. Who is the author of Common Spiders of North America? And they also yeah. said, thank you, and you have a very nice program. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. That was, um, I had two recommendations here. Uh, the Common Spiders of North America was by Richard Bradley. Richard Bradley. Um, that book has excellent because I'm a very picture-oriented person. That one has excellent colored pictures. And also, if you want a you know, smaller hands guide or field guide one, um, that, that other one was by Arthur Evans. Arthur Evans. I have actually a question. Uh, I sure. used to have, when I first moved here, I was renting a place that had a ton of wolf spiders. And they were big ones, too, like pretty big. Um, I noticed, though, a few of them, were, were like missing a leg do they fight with each other and that's how they lose their legs or was it just like a weird freak incident or something that's a good question um actually the only ones that are um because there is intraguild predation which is where you know essentially cannibalism basically you know where a spider will eat another spider i guess that wasn't the right term to use yeah they they are can be very territorial and you know very fight each other that might have been why that leg was missing. Or maybe your cat tried to mess with it, maybe. There are other spiders, like link spiders, that actually exhibit social behavior um, and actually do not, you know, consume, um, you know, other link spiders. Um, you know, so there, it just kind of differs between species. We have another question here. Uh, is venom bad for animals? It's been bad for like for pets. That's a good I question. would assume, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would make sure I keep a lookout for those two that we talked about, that black widow and the brown recluse. Unless anyone else has another experience where a dog or a cat was maybe bit by that uh, venomous spider, I have not heard of any cases uh, that can take down maybe a, a cat or a dog uh, that isn't a brown recluse or, or a black widow. But I, I could be wrong there. Um, but there's always a concern. So you know, if your pet is you know uh, messing with the with the spider. Um, let's try to save that spider and your dog or cat. So. We have another question here. Uh, is the cellar spider the one hiding in the corner that shakes when threatened? That could be a behavior in the, in the cobweb that is actually using vibrations. I have not seen that behavior myself, uh, so it could very well be a cellar spider. Uh, if it was, you know, had those very long legs. And, you know, that does seem like a cellar spider behavior to create a cobweb in a corner like that. And so it could very well, be, you know, either be a cellar spider or a house spider, uh, depending on that body shape. If you do have brown recluse, which are normally indoors, you know, what are some of the strategies or things you need to do to get rid of them? Yeah. Um, so definitely not recommending getting a paper towel and bundling it up. Uh, a lot of factors or variables that could go down with that and screaming involved um, <laughs> with your spouse. Um, so I would highly recommend, and this goes for all spiders, if you really want to get those egg sacs out or cobwebs out, um, get you a nice uh, you know, vacuum that can actually suck that up uh, and remove it from the area. Um, that does a great job at you know, removing the spider without putting you in harm's danger or harm's way. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Um, and then hopefully, you know, work on those tactics to, you know, maybe sit in those cracks where it may have came in, if you can find the source of that. Yeah, and and on that note too, and spraying the perimeter, 
Uh, a lot of our pesticides, um, you know, might not be specifically for spiders that we see, but those that are recommended for cockroaches um, and, you know, other you know, similar pests like that, uh, you know, ortho home defense or whatever product it may be, um, is, you know, you check with your extension agent first, you know, if you're not sure on the label or anything there, but um, do a great job at controlling the spiders as well. One point to mention as well is a lot of our spiders are actively hunting during, you know, are nocturnal. They're, they're hunting at night. Even the timing of application kind of go into the spiders at least, but um, definitely considering all the tools in the toolbox before going into spraying. I want to thank everybody for coming out for their lunch break. What, what better talk you could, could have on a nice fall day? Excellent. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, appreciate you all taking your time and of course you Seth great presentation and uh, Sounds good. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Bye.